me tell you how the ultra wealthy people build tons of wealth. Now, here's the terrifying thing. I'm going to give you advice that is something I don't actually want you to do. Whoa. Yeah. How can you do that? Well, I'm going to tell you how the system rewards people, but then I'm going to tell you why I think it's a bad idea. Okay. How do people get ahead in an economy where you have uh, high inflation and you have high interest rates? Well, we said it earlier, right before we clipped out of here, buying assets. So now the question is, what are those assets that you buy? Right. And how do you do it? So the answer really is um, you have to take on a lot of risk. Okay. And, and this is, is this what you were saying? I'm not really advising this. I'm really not yeah. advising this, right? This is going to be antithetical to like what Dave Ramsey would say. He'd say like, debt is dumb, just pay everything off. And while he's not wrong, uh, like I don't like unsecured debt, for example. But here's, here's the thing. If assets, you need assets that are appreciating faster than the cost to carry the asset. So what usually is that? Okay. Again. Disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. Not I am advice. not offering advice, nor am I making a recommendation you do this. Let's use um, Elon Musk as an example. Bunch of Tesla stock, right? So what does Elon do? Shows up at a bank, pledges his Tesla stock as collateral, takes a big loan out. Then goes and buys a big piece of real estate somewhere, or another company for that matter. But let's say he goes and buys a $100 million mansion. It's not a residence, but he's able to start depreciating that asset, right? He's got another asset. His Tesla stock he still owns, it's appreciating still. And what he has to do is pay the debt service on his loan. So let's say he's getting charged 5%. So yes, but what happens now? He owns two assets. And the assets are appreciating at 10%. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but oftentimes what happens is you will depreciate an asset and you will use the depreciation to cancel other income. So if he's got depreciation, he can cancel out other pass, like passive losses can, can cancel out, uh, passive income, right? And so he will lower his tax exposure, sell the real estate later and use some kind of, uh, what we call 1031 exchange to buy an even bigger place or multiple places. Repeat the process all over again. Still owns his Tesla stock and now owns twice as many assets. And is still just paying the debt service on the loan to continue to build this thing up. Instead of like an income. Instead of, and so he has zero income. Right. Right. But he owns a whole bunch of assets, all of which he can then, like if, if he buys an apartment complex, the apartment complex doubles in value, he could do a cash out refi, take all the cash out, not report his income, He's got that cash available in his pocket to buy more assets or pay for his lifestyle. And the cash flow from the apartments continues to pay off the loan that he has. Mm -hmm. And he can also write off the capital depreciation against the income. That's the game that the ultra wealthy plays. They layer into different tax structures. Hmm. Okay. So super frustrating when you go, well, great. How the heck am I supposed to reach that? Well, what I I keep telling people, one of the things that you need to do in order to navigate the changing workplace environment is to become more entrepreneurial. This doesn't mean that you have to be an entrepreneur uh, and start your own business, right? Okay. But it does mean that you need to find businesses that you can operate within that incentivize you to be an entrepreneur within that business. Right. Mm, Or like your interests are aligned. Yes. So, Matt, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about on this one. Yeah. I mean, an employer who's giving you an opportunity to also earn more as the business earns more. And there's a lot of different ways that that can be done. But you're basically just trying to say, hey, you can't have a fixed ceiling. You want, you know, that employee to be able to take the next step higher and then the next step higher from there where they're not just on the treadmill. Right, so here's the key for a lot of young folks in particular. Uh, I think that the advice, that's, the advice that's been handed down for generations is, needs to evolve. Right, because you know? the advice was save money, save money, and you'll be okay and work yeah. hard. Save money, work hard, you know, go to college, right. and all that stuff, it's and just, now it's it'll, like, just make, yeah. it'll make it work, right? College is now a barrier to entry for certain professions. But for the most part, 
college is just a really large expense. We're seeing people come out of college with $100,000 of debt and then a job that pays $80,000 a year. And you're like, okay, by the time you try and buy a house and pay off your college debt, you're going to be 60. Right. Well, and if you consider that you're going to go to college and then go into a job that there's not a lot of scarcity or a lot of demand, even worse, then you're going to end up not being paid real well. So you end up with lots of debt and a low income to, to match it. So you need to view education as an investment in yourself and your earning capacity. It needs to right. open doors, not close them. Right. Okay? Well, and so that's that's new for people. That didn't used to be the case. It used to be if you went hey, to college, you could count on making more money. I can sneak money. another good stat in here for I'm you. I'm ready. So since like 1997, I think, you look at the average hourly wage you know, growth of college graduates. Mm-hmm. It's been falling since 2000 as a percentage, right? And so we're not seeing more pay. We're seeing less. Right. So hence, hence my statement that college is not a guarantee no. that it will produce superior value. It, it needs to be viewed as an investment. And so what I encourage people to invest in is the right education and skill set to be marketable in the, in the workforce. And keep in mind that I'm not hating on McDonald's for this one, but where they get picked on a lot, which is that's a job that's really, really regimented. So anybody can do it. It's very entry level. And so they have their processes. You go and you follow the recipe and you do it their way. So because that's available to virtually anybody, it's not going to be highly compensated. Why? Because there's a huge supply of labor and not that many jobs for it. So you don't have to pay up. But if you increase your skill set and the things that make you in demand in the marketplace, that's how you get compensated better. And then if you bring that skill set to the work work environment and you add value by increasing revenue or helping other people increase revenue, right? Sometimes the job is supporting the revenue generation, not direct revenue generation. But you do that, then the company recognizes your value and they are able to pay you more. Right. So you want to be in a culture that operates that way. They align incentives so that you working harder means something rather than you working harder means the shareholder is the only beneficiary. Right. Okay. So anyway, that's, I think, the the fastest summary I can make for how does one uh, attempt to get a toehold in today in a world where I will acknowledge it is much more expensive today than it, it was in years past. And I think it's just the slippage that comes with a lot more regulations over a long enough period of time and a bunch of people trying to address a symptom rather than the root cause of the problem. It could be very well intended, but the compounding effect of bad policy over time is the opposite of the compounding effect of money over time. Right.